this video, we're going to do a brief discussion of discrimination. And this is a topic, discrimination and segregation and prejudice, that we could spend several entire courses looking at the economics of these subjects. But in this chapter, we're focused on income inequality and poverty. So we're going to try to focus on, mostly on the role that discrimination might play in income inequality, how economists view this and try to measure this, and why it's important from an economic perspective. Of course, there are many other perspectives that we could look at this from. We could look at this in a philosophical way, a sociological or human justice sort of way. Lots of angles you can come at this, but in this economics class, we'll try to stick with the economics as much as we can. But in general, discrimination happens when some group of workers that has the same abilities, education, training, experience, work ethic, and all those things. We take two people that are identical in all respects, except there's some characteristic about them. If we look at two groups of people and one is either getting worse treatment Worse opportunities, worse pay, that's discrimination. In economics, we get our inspiration, kind of our father of the study of discrimination in economics, was Gary Becker. And Gary Becker won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1992. And his dissertation, when he was working on his PhD at the University of Chicago, was on discrimination. So this is a long time ago, and Gary Becker was a true pioneer in thinking about discrimination from an economic perspective. All the things we've talked about in this course so far, costs and benefits and utility and decision-making and looking at the marginal costs and the marginal benefits and trying to approach the study of discrimination from a very scientific approach. How can we measure it? How can we describe it? And are there any theoretical underpinnings as to how it might happen and why? So Gary Becker wrote a book based on his dissertation, simply called The Economics of Discrimination. And Gary Becker was not only very famous for his work on discrimination, he was famous for taking the economic principles of, again, costs, benefits, utility, decision-making, supply and demand, and applying them to all kinds of interesting things that nobody before him thought could actually be done. For example, Gary Becker used economics to study the economics of the family. How do people decide who to marry, how many children to have? Well, you can think about this in the terms of economics. Now, when it comes to the economics of discrimination, we usually boil down the types of discrimination into a few different types. The first type is just what we call wage discrimination. And this is just the idea that you've got two groups of people, blacks and whites, or men and women, and they're identical with regard to their skills and their experience and everything else. And you're just simply paying people less for the same work. Now, a lot of people talk about this idea of paying people less for the same work just by looking at averages. Remember, we had the video on gender wage discrimination. And we talked about a lot of things where we're not necessarily looking at exactly the same people doing exactly the same job with exactly the same education. When we look at these average numbers, like women are paid 77 cents on the dollar for men or 81 cents, it changes a little bit from year to year. So you have to be careful when you talk about wage discrimination. It's very difficult to measure, so it can be something that is very subtle and difficult to detect exactly how big it is. But typically the approach an economist takes is they try to look at people working for a company and they measure everything they possibly can about those people. Their years of experience, their education, their amount of responsibility, the work hours that they have and try to explain everything we possibly can that would be a legitimate difference in the wages between two people. And then anything that's left over, that might be discrimination. So when we say that, at least today, wage discrimination is subtle and difficult to detect, now there probably is wage discrimination, and most economists agree that there is some leftover amount that can't be explained. When you're looking between black people and white people, and between men and women, 
and it seems like there's something left over there that we can't legitimately explain, and that amount probably is due to some kind of discrimination. Now, if we go back in history, though, I'm an optimist. I want to talk about some of the good things. If we go back in history, things weren't so subtle and things weren't so hard to measure. If we go back almost 100 years and we look at North Carolina, there's this fascinating article. This article is called North Carolina and the New Industrial Revolution by C.R. Fay, published in the Economic Journal back in 1925. And the story here is there was a British economist, this guy C.R. Fay, and he took a trip over to the United States and he toured around the United States a little bit. And when he got back to Britain, he wrote this article about North Carolina and how fascinated he was about the economy of North Carolina and how it works. And he wrote this description for the entire world of what North Carolina's economy was like at that time. So if you're from North Carolina like I am, this is a really exciting thing to read. And I'll post a link to it for you. So if you're interested, you can read more about this. But it talks about how big North Carolina is. It talks about there were two and a half million people back then. There's over 10 million people in North Carolina now. It talks about more than two thirds are white, less than 1% are foreign born. And we can compare some of those things to now. We often hear in North Carolina that High Point is where a lot of furniture is made, and it was true back then, almost 100 years ago. Now, why I'm bringing this up when we're talking about discrimination and how in the past the discrimination was not so subtle and how much things have changed, and let's look at some of this British person's description about wages in different kinds of factories in North Carolina. So in this section of the paper, Professor Fay is describing some of the different wages that people make in North Carolina in different kinds of factories. And in this section, he's talking about cotton and hosiery mills in Greensboro and Durham. And he says, in a cotton mill, men make between 573 down to 232, and this is per day. Women make 488 to $1.50. So this is coming from a guy who had only been in North Carolina for a very short period of time, and without a lot of sophisticated analysis, he was able to see very clearly that men make a lot more than women. Now, assuming that in these factories that the women had the same amount of skill set and were able to do the job as quickly and as proficiently as men, I don't know. Maybe these were jobs where... It was just based on your raw strength that you had to be carrying large bales of cotton or something around. If so, maybe some of this could be legitimate. But we see a pretty significant difference here between 573 and 488 and 232 on the low end down to $1.50. In a hosiery mill, $5 to $1.66 for men, women, $3.33 to $1.33. Now, here they say an explanation kind of similar to what I was saying, that some of these workers worked on piece rates. And a piece rate means you get paid based on how fast you work. So the more pieces you can complete when you're sewing, the more you're going to get paid. And so some of this might not be true discrimination as we're thinking about it. It might be based on just how fast you can work. Now let's go down to the next line here, talking about a tobacco factory in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Men, $7 to $2. Women, $4 down to $1.50. Now here is where the differences aren't so subtle again. It says here, as in number two and in number four, where they're going to talk about a factory in the next section, the lower figure may be assumed to be for colored labor or for beginners. So this is where it was just so obvious to this person from Britain coming to a factory in North Carolina and seeing right away that women are making less than men and that people who make less are also likely to be colored labor or beginners. That is obvious in-your-face discrimination. There's no hiding it. This foreigner could learn this in no time. So this piece of history, this article that's almost 100 years old now, it's fascinating, but it's also a bit shocking when you read these kinds of things. 
but it does give me hope. Again, I'm the optimist that today when we're looking for discrimination, we do have to look very hard at the data. It's not just obvious. And I would bet that in some of these factories 100 years ago, you would go in and they would actually have things up on the wall about how the amount women are going to make is going to be less than men and the amount that black people are going to make is going to be less than that for white people. It's just that obvious from somebody coming from another country. So again, in today's economy, when we look for discrimination, usually we have to have a lot of data and use some very sophisticated statistical techniques to try to detect when wage discrimination is happening and how much there is. 100 years ago, not so much. It was pretty easy and obvious to everybody who looked. Employment discrimination is when some kinds of people are less likely to get jobs in the first place or less likely to get promotions once they get a job. So that's kind of an obvious topic. How about occupational discrimination? Occupational discrimination is when some people are arbitrarily restricted from doing certain kinds of jobs. Now again, we go back in history, this was a little bit more obvious. If you haven't seen this movie, Something the Lord Made, this film came out in 2004 and it was nominated for nine Emmy Awards. It won three Emmy Awards. It was a very, very interesting movie about this man named Vivian Thomas. He was hired at a hospital and originally he was hired to be a janitor. But then a doctor that he was working with pretty quickly figured out that he was pretty smart and pretty talented and that his talents were being wasted as being a janitor. And so it's about how this person, Vivian Thomas, ended up really being instrumental in developing some surgeries that have saved many, many lives. Well, this is a case where today we still seem to have a lot of occupational discrimination. And whether it is overt discrimination, where people simply are not hiring people, or whether it is something a little bit more hidden, we still have most doctors are men and most nurses are women. We still have some built-in prejudices in society that girls ought to be nurses and that boys ought to be doctors. That's changing somewhat. It's changing slowly. I think things are getting better, but I think we all wish that things could change a little more rapidly. Number four kind of discrimination is human capital discrimination. And this is the idea that some types of people, depending on where you live, what kind of neighborhood you live in, you systematically get a worse education. So when an economist talks about human capital, we talk about the training, the education, and the skills that you have that make you a more valuable employee and make you to where you can earn more. So there have been a lot of studies that have found that in some neighborhoods that are primarily Hispanic or African American, that those kinds of schools get less funding and those kinds of schools have lower test scores. Here's an image supporting that where we see that the typical Asian, the people in their school score in the 62nd or 63rd percentile. Typical white student goes to a school. If you look at all those schools, they're typically going to a school where the people in that school are scoring in the 60th percentile, whereas Hispanics, only about the 40th percentile, blacks about the 37th percentile. So there's something about where people live or what kind of school they're going to where the scores at those schools are systematically different for Asians and white people compared to Hispanics and black people. So this might be an example of human capital discrimination. Now let me show you something I think is fascinating. Here's a little simulation. This is a free program that you can download called NetLogo. And NetLogo is a simulation program where you can put in different parameters, write a little bit of computer code, and get it to run the simulation and show you what pops out, show you what the results are. So in this simulation, what we're doing is we are putting people in houses and we're showing the results of prejudice here a little bit and why it is that people live in segregated neighborhoods. And perhaps that has something to do with why Hispanics and Blacks go to different schools than whites or Asians is because people tend to cluster together in neighborhoods with people like themselves. And the interesting thing with this simulation is that you don't have to hate 
people of a certain kind in order to end up having massive segregation where people live in clusters of people like them. So here's what I mean. In this simulation, what we do in this little slider is we give people a very small preference not to be alone. And what that means is, suppose we were talking about blacks and whites. Suppose people, I don't have anything against people who aren't like me, but suppose I just have a small, small preference that at least one of my neighbors is like me. Okay, so I don't mind most of my neighbors being different from me, but it would be nice if maybe either the person across the street or one of the two people to the left or the right of me is somebody who's like me. And if I'm surrounded by people who aren't like me, I'm going to move. So in this little simulation we're going to run, I put in here only 20% similar wanted. So that means that only one out of five people in the houses surrounding me needs to be like me to make me comfortable. But if there's nobody like me, I'm going to move. Let's see what happens in this simulation. So what this simulation does is it randomly assigns people to start with, and then it has people move if there's no one like them next door. So here is the initial random setup. And you see there's a lot of mingling here with the blue and the orange squares. Now, let's run this simulation. I'm going to click Go once here. And again, people here are moving if no one, like themselves, is a neighbor. And they keep moving until everybody's happy. You see how much clustering there is here? How many little pockets of all blue and all orange there is? And this is just with a very, very small preference for having somebody like you in your neighborhood. Let's crank this up from 20% to say 30%. Now I want 30% eh, of the people to be like me. 70% of people could be different, and I'm fine with that as long as I have 30% of my neighbors being like me. Let's set it up again, which is just random, and let's hit go, and people move until look at all that segregation. It makes me hopeful, believe it or not. Why hopeful? Well, because when we talk about residential segregation, we always hear stories about how it's because people refuse to sell to certain people or people are hounded out of a neighborhood if they're different from the people living in the neighborhood. And here we see it doesn't have to be that way. People might just have a very small preference to have a small percentage of neighbors look like them, and we end up with lots and lots of segregation. Now let's look and see what that looks like where I live. So this is what we call a racial dot map, and this is of Greensboro, North Carolina. And in this map we're looking at a green dot is an African-American household, a blue dot is a white household, and the red dots are Hispanic households. And you see how much segregation there is looking at this image. All these very, very, very green clusters over here, all these very, very blue clusters over here. And not a lot, but a few neighborhoods where there are a sprinkling of very different colors in the neighborhood. So not as much integration as we would hope. So that brings us on to the Next kind of discrimination that we identify, and that's called statistical discrimination. Statistical discrimination is when people discriminate based on something that has some truth for a group as a whole, but they fail to look at people as individuals. So the reasoning for statistical discrimination by someone might go like this, since you're the part of some group who on average, you saw some study, and there's really some data to back this up, some group is on average worse than some other group at something. And so you take that data, you digest it, and you're like, okay, well, I shouldn't hire this kind of person because they're worse than this kind of person. And there's a certain logic there, but it's a faulty logic. Just because on average, people in one group are better at something than another, does not take into account the fact that within each group, there are some brilliant people at everything. There are some terrible people at everything. So there's distributions of both groups. 
So just because the average of one group is higher than another doesn't mean that everybody in that group is better than the other. So a silly example for me, since I'm from North Carolina, would be to say, well, people from South Carolina just aren't as good as people from North Carolina, so therefore I'm not going to hire people from South Carolina. And it's true that people from North Carolina are better. If you look at average SAT scores, at least, the average SAT score in North Carolina is 1,081 points, and the average in South Carolina is only 1,064 points. I might use that as justification to myself in my own mind to say, you know, I'm just not willing to hire people from South Carolina. No matter what kind of discrimination we're talking about here, whether it's employment discrimination or wage discrimination or occupational discrimination or statistical discrimination, what Gary Becker, this Nobel Prize winner, came up with is the idea of, okay, well, why do we have discrimination and how can we measure it? And let's think about this from a costs and benefits kind of model. And he said, well, let's think about the utility of someone who might be discriminating. Why do they hire people anyway? he came up with this thing called the taste for discrimination model. And he basically said this, look, I might have a utility function here. And my utility function says that I would like to hire somebody just as like me as possible. I want to hire somebody from North Carolina and somebody who is of my race and somebody who was in the same fraternity as me and somebody who went to Duke University and all these other things. So my utility function is based on all these preferences that I want to work with people who are like me. So we could say, you know, my max utility here would be to work with people as much like me as possible. And that makes a certain kind of sense. Now, personally, I'm not like this. I like to work with people and hang around with people who aren't like me because I'm more likely to learn something by hanging out with people who are different from myself. And so the taste for discrimination model might go like this. Suppose I see someone with certain characteristics. Maybe they have a four-year degree and they have uh, 10, year, 10 years of experience and they have all these skills. And when I add up all those skills for that person, I say, you know, that kind of person is worth $50,000 per year. That's the most that kind of person is worth. The taste for discrimination model comes up with something we call a discrimination coefficient that says, if I don't like a certain kind of person, I don't have a taste for working with women or I don't like working with Hispanics, for example, then I'm not willing to hire one of those people that I don't like if I have to pay them $50,000. However, I might be willing to hire somebody who's worth 50000 as long as I can get them at a discount. So I might say for a certain kind of person, eh, I don't really want to work with that kind of person, but I will. If I'm the owner of the company, if I can get them for, say, $40,000, then the fact that I'm getting a good quality person, but I'm getting a discount, so I'm going to make more profit from that person, maybe that would make up for the fact that I don't really kind of want to work with that kind of person. Does that make sense? Well, in a way. So there's a logic to it. It's not something that we would like to see, but that's one kind of way to try to explain why it is we see wage discrimination in the market. So by measuring what people should make and then comparing how much they do make, we can get an idea of this discrimination coefficient. And the idea is that it would be different for different employers and different for different businesses. The kind of discrimination is going to be different based on how much somebody dislikes working with people of a certain kind of group. Now, here's the interesting thing. Economic theory suggests that in the long run, businesses that discriminate should fail. Why is this? The idea is, suppose we're in a town and every business discriminates except one. I'm the one business that decides I'm not going to discriminate. I don't mind working with these people. I just want to hire the best people at the best price I can. So if there are a lot of people at this company where they're being discriminated against and they're making $40,000, but they're really worth 50, dollars 
if my firm only hires the people that have been discriminated against, I could hire all these people away for just a little bit more than 40. And while this guy is paying all the people like him a high salary, I'm going to be able to make higher profits or price my product lower and drive this other person out of business because I'll be able to have all the really good employees and be paying them a higher amount than this person would be willing to pay them, only the 40000 but I'll still be able to produce more efficiently and more cheaply, and I'll drive the discriminators out of business. Now, while this is an appealing theory, a lot of research has found that this doesn't quite seem to be the case. Even after lots and lots of years, it still seems like there is some wage discrimination going on, and we have not seen every single business that appears to be discriminating go out of business, at least not yet. So this has been a really quick look, really brief look at the economic analysis of discrimination. Again, we could spend a lot of time reading more about this. If you want to read more about this, I'll provide you with a couple of extra links to read some more up on it. But this is the basic idea, and I hope you've learned a lot by doing this. So this is Dr. Berkey signing out. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to discuss them with you. How do you feel about these ideas of discrimination? Do you think that people are discriminating less now than they were 50 or 100 years ago? Or do you think that it's still just as bad a problem as it was back then? I'd love to hear your thoughts and discuss it. But other than that, I wish you the best of luck in all of your studies, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.